a starting point. The reason why we wanted to do this uh, this feature and, and take a look at what academics were saying is that you see there's a sense that China always wins. That if, um, you know, the, that as long as Beijing uh, provides subsidies, um, any industry it decides to look at um, will succeed. Um, and that, you know, because of this, the U.S. needs to either emulate China or respond very strongly to prevent sort of a tech, um, um, uh, you know, the, the tech takeover on the part of, of Beijing. Uh, so we we thought, you know, let's look at what academics are actually saying when they are looking at the data, especially, you know, from a quantitative part of, point of view, as well as, you know, qualitative. Um, and, and what we found was that there, the topic um, has been treated in a variety of ways with some very different conclusions. Um, the first, you know, the first strand of literature is the that which has been, you know, research has been going on for several decades, but I think is still very relevant today. And it looks at the experience of different countries um, using industrial policy. You have the developmental states, you have a lot of failures. A lot of the successes are, folk, are concentrated in East Asia, um, Taiwan, Japan, um, uh, South Korea, um, to a certain extent, uh, you know, China itself. And then many other countries have had failures. And the, really, you know, there's various factors that determine that, uh, but uh, the, the incentive structure for firms and um, uh, and the the the, in, the introduction of of, of um, discipline uh, mechanisms for firms are really important, right? That discipline can come through a variety of ways: exports, competition internally, competition externally. Um, you know, a sort of independent bureaucracy. But generally speaking, you need to have something to counterbalance that that uh, availability of, of of state support, which can uh, lead to a lot of sort of capture. Um, the second strand of literature, uh, which is really important, and I think some of the the you know the our panelists today will be speaking to, is that which develop comes out of sort of China's peculiar developmental trajectory. So China, in many ways, is. Um, has a very hybrid economy, and that's due to the fact that it came from a fully communist economy um, in the 1970s to one that has somewhat opened up and somewhat reformed, right? And so a lot of this research is sort of focusing on, is China still reforming? Um, is China backtracking? What are, you know, what are the impacts on different sectors that we're seeing and what 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 does it all mean? Um, and then thirdly, I think very interestingly, and I think especially in, in recent times, we're seeing a uh, rise of of, of studies that are interested in learning lessons from China. Um, and that's especially in those industries where China has been so successful, like clean tech specifically, right? EV, solar panels. And so I think that's that's also an interesting sort of strand of literature to to take a look at and, and, and maybe draw some lessons from it. And then finally, and I'm looking forward to discussing this as well with our panel, is there's global implications to industrial policy, right? Um, and I think we, we know that there's ongoing trade tensions, tariffs, um, um, disputes at the WTO and and elsewhere um, in uh, you know that that are centered around subsidies um, and I think you know what what happens when a country as big as China engages in this sort of uh, very extensive industrial policy and broadly speaking what happens when everybody else is also engaging in, in broad industrial policy so I think this all is um, you know important to keep in mind and I think you know there's a few conclusions that we that we've reached uh, based on on the this review. Um, the first is the type of technology matters, right? So complex technologies like semiconductors, maybe commercial aircrafts, these are these are harder to um, uh, to make progress on because there's um, um, you know existing incumbent players. They they might have uh, a lot of IP. Uh, it's very concentrated in many cases. Um, but instead, in the cases where the technology is less mature and there's less, you know, maybe the technology is more diffuse. It's easier to acquire. Um, and there's more space to make progress. And maybe, you know, there's a lot of learning by doing opportunities, very modular technologies, think batteries, think solar panels. There, you know, uh, Chinese industrial policy has been uh, particularly effective in, in, you know, in a variety of metrics. And I think my colleague Ryan will talk a little more about metrics itself, which is a whole other topic. Um, 
And and then you know, second thing is not all industrial policies are the same, right? So policy design matters. I spoke about this a little bit earlier. Uh, of course, you know, having more, uh, you know, the more discipline within the system, uh, more competition, more market-based tools, right, actually uh, leads to better outcomes. And and you see this even within China. Um, and then third, right, access to foreign technology um, has uh, has been important, right? So I think I, we we think about China's um, indigenous innovation, uh, and we time, sometimes forget the role of foreign direct investment, of uh, globalized value chains, of um, technology transfer, um, and and the core technology diffusion in many ways, and also the importance of having access to foreign markets. So I think these are all sort of broad lessons that that are worth keeping in mind. But let me turn to my colleague um, Ryan Federson, a research associate with the trustee chair, and let me ask um, Ryan to give me, you know, just a you know a little bit of a sense of uh, what his takeaway was from reading um, the 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 many papers we we reviewed and books that we take took a look at, um, and specifically, you know, uh, Ryan, if you if you want to give us a sense about the the, the different ways in which industrial policy has been assessed by by scholars. Yes, thanks, Solari. I think uh, you already mentioned it a little bit, but one of the things that I found very interesting about the research that we looked at is I think in the policy community, oftentimes we we see certain outcomes of industrial policy and those are often discussed. Uh, maybe it's global trade flows, uh, maybe to some degree it's market share. Uh, but I found that the academic research really looked at a, a really large uh, variety of ways that you can measure the success of industrial policy, everything from market share, industry revenue, um, measures of innovation, like you know the total amount of patenting, uh, you know all sorts of different uh, measures. Um, and so that is one challenge with, with the research is that um, you can look at the total amount of money spent in industrial policy, uh, but that doesn't really give you a sense of how effective um, it's, it's necessarily been. Um, and so, so that was something I, I found particularly interesting. I mean, there really are a, a variety of ways to evaluate um, the, the, the question of effectiveness. And depending on which one of those uh, variables you look at, you could draw very different conclusions about exactly um, how effective uh, a given policy uh, was. Um, I think all of the, the different case studies that we looked at um, in the feature uh, kind of provided different windows into that. Um, that sense of measurement as well. So, for example, we we featured uh, research done by uh, Panla, who's on the uh, panel, and and some of her, her colleagues on shipbuilding. Um, in that case, uh, you know, there was a, a large amount of uh, policy support. There were multiple uh, types of support, everything from entry subsidies that, that focused on getting firms to enter the market to investment subsidies. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of that policy ended up being incredibly wasteful. Um, and and I think in economic terms, you might think of it as a failure, right? And that it wasn't a very effective policy. Or there was a lot of waste. At the same time, you know, China gained significant market share in that industry. And so if you're a Chinese policymaker, you you could end up walking away from that um, experience feeling pretty satisfied, right, with, with the results of that policy. And so it depends on which lens uh, you look at uh, uh, or which variable you're, you're, you're trying to measure when, you, when you're thinking about the success of, of a policy. Um, I think electric vehicles is a similar one where uh, it was interesting for me when we looked at some research that was done maybe a decade ago, um, there was a lot less uh, confidence about the effectiveness of, of, of electric vehicle policy. Um, and there were, you know, in, in fact, some, some of the papers... Uh, even even we're suggesting that there were you know the possibility of failure, but of course policy design changed. There was a there was a focus on on consumers and what they wanted, a focus on attributes of, of electric vehicles themselves, um, the 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 quality of batteries, the distance of of electric vehicles, um, and so the policy became more effective. And 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 there are also certain enabling conditions that 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 made um, that that uh, policy perhaps more conducive, such as the the presence of foreign firms in the market. Um, access to access to global technology. Um, and then the final industry we looked at, uh, semiconductors, um, is one often discussed today, it was very interesting because, of course, there's a lot of industrial policy support in China, but there's also a lot of industrial policy support around the world. Um, and so even though China has thrown a lot of money at semiconductors and there have been um, improvements, particularly in um, the less advanced technology nodes, um, it has not been an unvarnished um, policy success. And there have been significant setbacks, uh, such as widespread you know, corruption or kind of failed projects associated with, with the bin fu big fund and other, other investments. So 
so yeah, I think uh, that was something I found interesting is that uh, as our as the title of our feature suggests, wins and losses, uh, the record of industrial policy is really much more mixed, I think, than um, we often uh, get the impression of uh, here in uh, the policy community in Washington. Great. Thank you, Ryan. I think it's important um, to highlight that um, the definition of success matters, right? Um, and that uh, policymakers may have different uh, definitions of success, especially at a time when, um, you know, national security concerns um, and economic security concerns uh, sometimes trump the sort of commercial, economic, traditional economic uh, metrics and, and objectives. Um, but let me turn to our panel. Um, let me introduce them briefly. So today we have joining us Lee Branstetter, um, James Walton Professor of Economics and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University a senior economist on President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors in 2011 to 2012. Um, Professor Brandstetter has a PhD in economics from Harvard University and MBA from Northwestern University. Welcome. Um, and we also have Professor Panla Jabarwick. Uh, she is the Todd E. and Elizabeth H. Warnock Distinguished Chair Professor in the Economics Department at UW-Madison. Um, that is University of, of Wisconsin-Madison. She is a faculty research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research. She co-founded the, uh, Cor the Cornell Institute for China Economic Research and um, University of Wisconsin-Madison's Pan-Asia Pacific Sustainability Initiative and uh, serves as um, the board member for um, the China Economic Research, the Cornell Institute for China Economic Research, and for um, and she's co-director of the Pan Asia Pacific Sustainability Initiative. Um, we also have uh, joining us from Paris, Chloe Papazian. She is a trade policy analyst trade policy analyst with the Trade and Agriculture Directorate at the OECD uh, since 2021. She holds an a LLM in European Legal Studies from the College of Europe and a PhD in Law from the European University Institute in Florence, where she worked on the interplay between climate change mitigation subsidy and the deep WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. Before joining the OECD, Chloe also worked for a research institute on the legal and policy implications of Brexit from a trade perspective and for a law firm based in Brussels uh, focused on uh, trade related issues. Finally, um, we have Gerard Di Pippo uh, joining us from DC, I think. Uh, in, he is Senior Geoeconomics Analyst for Bloomberg Economics. He was pre previously a Senior Fellow here at the Center for Strategic International Studies, uh, a good colleague. We also co-authored a paper uh, that is relevant to today's discussion on um, uh, industrial policy with uh, also our colleague Scott Kennedy. He pre previously spent 11 years in the US intelligence community um, and uh, Welcome to you all. Um, let me start uh, with uh, Professor Lee Brandstetter. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about this question about effectiveness of industrial policy, Chinese industrial policy? You've looked at um, a lot of different metrics, um, and you've had, I think, a more skeptical view, or uh, you know, I think you've been encouraging people to think of more, a little more realistically about what productivity means um, and and the effectiveness of, of subsidies. Um, why don't you tell us a little more about that? Sure. Thanks, Laria. So I think it is useful for us to focus our thinking on the productivity of firms, industries, and economies. The key to national prosperity in the long run is for a nation to become more productive, to generate the highest possible output with a given level of capital, labor, and materials inputs. And I also want to emphasize the long run. Uh, economic development is a marathon, not a sprint. Short-run growth at the industry level it's not necessarily a very useful metric of success if it doesn't contribute to long-run productivity growth. So becoming more productive is really China's key challenge in the coming decades. Its labor force is no longer growing yeah. shrinking by as many as 200 million workers in the coming decades, which is more than the entire current labor force of the United States. Capital investment is running into diminishing returns in industry after industry in order for living standards to grow, and converge to those of first world nations under these conditions, China has to become more efficient and effective at generating the most possible output given its shrinking labor inputs. So is industrial policy helping? Does industrial policy make the firms and industries that are its focus more productive 
than the firms and industries that are not its focus. Now, at least theoretically, this could happen. And we might expect it to happen if government policy makers are able to identify the firms and industries that are already more innovative and dynamic than their peers, and then provide them with resources and incentives that enable them to become even more innovative, even more dynamic, and even more productive as a consequence of this policy intervention. Notice that our argument relies on government being better able to identify the opportunities for productivity improvement than the market is. Is that, is, is that what is going on in China today? I think, for the most part, no. In my research, I found that firms and industries receiving policy support and intervention, as I measure it, and as my uh, co-authors measure it, tend to be relatively less productive than firms that don't. And after receiving this support, the firms that are the recipient become, if anything, even less productive in relative terms than they were before receiving the support. And even if we focus on subsidies associated with the Made in China 2025 policy initiative, we see no statistical evidence that the support leads to higher productivity or better innovative outcomes. Uh, now, this doesn't rule out the possibility that there are a handful of successes, but on average, the impact appears to be a negative one. Why is this? Well, Ilari, it's interesting that your paper referenced the older literature on Japanese and South Korean industrial policy. I think I may be the only person on this panel who's old enough to have actually participated in and contributed to that old literature on Japanese industrial policy. And what that literature found as I read it is that Japan's industrial policy mandarins back in their heyday were actually no more successful than China's have been on average. Japan did not pick winners any better than China is doing today. There was no more correlation between Japanese policy support and productivity than there is in China today. Why is industrial, so, so, uh, industrial policy so hard to implement effectively, at least on average? Well, governments inevitably have conflicting objectives. They want to pick winners, but also compensate the losers. They want disruptive innovation, but also social stability. They want dynamic innovation, but also state control. And trying to do everything everywhere all at once makes it harder to improve on market outcomes. Identifying firms that can actually invent the technologies of tomorrow is much harder than identifying the firms that can copy the technologies of the present. Just ask any venture capitalist. And finally, firms and regional governments can respond opportunistically to central government initiatives in ways that undermine desired outcomes. Again, there's an old literature from the 1980s, right? The strategic trade policy literature of the 1980s that actually anticipated this. Papers by authors like Horseman and Markison and Eaton and Grossman, some of whom are sadly no longer with us, predicted that industrial policy could lead to a wave of inefficient entry that undermines the national benefits from industrial policy. And of course, decades later, brilliant empiricists like Panla Jabarwik have quantified that in the context of China, okay? So, um, you know, if this policy doesn't seem to be working, then what should be the American policy response? Well, I certainly don't think that we should follow China down an industrial policy rabbit hole that's not contributing to macro productivity growth at the aggregate level. And, and by the way, you know, even if you want to discount all of my research, I think it's well established um, and well accepted among China scholars that China's aggregate rate of total factor productivity growth has substantially declined in recent years. And the rate at which China is converging to the productivity frontier represented by the United States and other first world countries has declined sharply in recent years, right? That doesn't augur well for future success. Future success. So if we don't wanna follow the Chinese example, and of course I'm painfully aware that you know, the outgoing administration has to some extent done so, what should we do? Well, I would argue that in the name of national security, the United States should vastly increase its levels of high-skilled immigration. One of the most powerful advantages the United States has in any kind of competition with China or anyone else is our attractiveness as a place to do business, to study, to do research, 
to invent the future. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of very highly skilled entrepreneurial people who would love to exercise their talent in the United States if we would just give them the opportunity to do so. Right? And the fact that we turn away so many of these outstanding, highly productive, innovative individuals um, is probably one of the most amazing own goals in the history of international competition. And of course, anything that future presidential administrations would do that would make the United States less attractive as a place for highly skilled immigra uh, immigrants to go to um, is going to deeply undermine America's own future prospects for innovation and productivity growth. So increase high-skilled immigration. Secondly, I think the United States should increase government funding of pre-commercial basic science. And of course, you know, as uh, you know, Elon Musk and others uh, consider ways to cut trillions of dollars from the government budget, I'm very worried that one of the things that will cut uh, is expenditure that has been among America's most successful investments in the future, right? Funding by the science agencies in university-based research that has actually laid the groundwork for major industrial advances like those in AI. So it's important that we invest in this, but that we not put all of our eggs in the currently fashionable baskets. We sped, spread it around because what we learned from technology history is that the currently fashionable cutting edge areas were not always the places that venture capitalists were investing in and they won't always be in the future. The locus of technological opportunity can and does move, and we need to be prepared for that movement. Finally, I think we should aggressively seek to integrate U.S. firms and workers into global supply chains that include our allies and partners. China may and perhaps will grow larger than the United States in absolute economic size, but it's very hard for it, uh, me to imagine it growing larger than the entire Western alliance, especially if, if we define the Western alliance broadly to include the East Asian industrial democracies and other advanced industrial democratic countries. I think our military and economic security in the long run may depend on the health and longevity of that alliance and anything that future presidential administrations might do to undermine those ties and undermine those alliances weakens the United States very substantially in the competition that's underway. Finally, I think the United States needs to invest much more strongly and aggressively and effectively in a safety net that cushions our workers and families against the disruption that trade and innovation inevitably generate. And economists have come up with a lot of ideas over the decades. Wage insurance, a vastly expanded earned income tax credit, an intelligently designed child tax credit, there's no shortage of good ideas that could be implemented that could pretty cost-effectively cushion that minority of workers upon whom the burden of disruption inevitably rests. But I don't think that industrial policy is the path forward. Um, and if anything good might come out of a turning of administrations, um, it might be a turning away from policy initiatives that I'm quite concerned um, are not going to generate outcomes and con contributions to aggregate productivity that are commensurate with their costs. Okay, in the interest of giving my distinguished plenty of time to under time. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I think that was really useful um, as a starting point. Uh, I think um, everybody will have much to to say um, to that and and um, on their own. Um, I will say, you know, I think it is uh, sometimes frustrating that we talk so much about industrial policy these days and we forget that innovation policy and productivity policy can be much broader, right? And that there's some fundamentals that you need to get right. And actually, that was one of the findings is that um, looking also at China is that some of the industries that have done well, it's not entirely clear that it's just uh, government support, right? It may actually be very entrepreneurial companies. Companies and maybe that they got the fundamentals right in some cases. Um, so let me turn uh, to Professor Ja Barwick. 
um, and uh, ask you a little bit to talk a little bit more about you know this question of um, you know industrial policy and how to measure the effectiveness or you know what effectiveness you have seen and, and failures. Um, and I would just note that you've done very you know impressive work across a variety of different sectors, right? We cited your work on um, on shipbuilding. Uh, uh, you've done a lot of work on EVs and uh, a variety of other topics as well. So um, why don't you um, give us a bit of a sense of how you're looking at this issue? And I'm going to encourage everybody to take maybe um, three minutes or so to answer so that we have enough time for then, uh, for a discussion later. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Irene, Hilaria. Um, so as you mentioned, I have studied uh, shipbuilding, the auto, traditional auto sector, and, and recently I've been focusing on electric vehicle sector, not just in China, but globally. And um, um, to give you a summary, uh, as Lee has pointed out, um, the industrial policies aren't always a success, depending on the benchmark. And I want to mention that industrial policies are inherently complex. We have a lot of policy instruments that can be used. And um, the settings are also very complex. Technologies are different, firms are different. The implementation of industrial policies are also very important. So in some of our work, we highlight that how you implement industrial policies, even if the, instru the instruments are identical can make a big difference. For example, in China, we show that in shipbuilding, the early on this planned uh, subsidy to every, every firm is vastly wasteful and attracts uh, rent seeking and entry of inefficient firms and essentially later on went belly up when the aggregate environment is not so favorable. And then what uh, China did, to China's credit, the policy was quickly changed um, in response to some of the you know, negative consequences, and the government shifted support toward uh, firms that are more efficient. For example, they use they essentially shifted to from away from entry subsidies, which are wasteful, to investment subsidies that are much more likely to be taken up by efficient firms, you know, firms that have a long run um, horizon, long uh, long term um, uh, objective that are, you know, essentially will be more likely to take up investment subsidies or production subsidies. So then the the policy, even though it's the same, you know, industrial policy targeting to shipbuilding has improved the effectiveness both in terms of output revenue and to us, you know, welfare, how much additional uh, surplus is generated improved significantly over the course of the of the policy. And so essentially we, we're trying to argue that um, their industrial policies are inherently complex and how you do it, you know, targeting or incentivizing more efficient firms to participate. And later on, I will talk about EV where innovation and learning by doing are important, um, essentially indu you know, induce uh, additional um, uh, benefits generated would be very important. Timing is also very important. Here we show that um, most of the policies are pro-cyclical, which are wasteful because when the industry is already at full capacity, expanding more is very costly. Counter-cyclical policies, on the other hand, would essentially utilize the underutilized uh, resources. So our look at uh, our study at the China's traditional auto industry, which is a quid pro quo policy that was at the forefront of the U.S. and China tension um, in 2018, and a key justification for the Trump administration to impose tariff. Um, so we studied, we essentially followed the auto industry from 2001 to 2014 where China's uh, passenger auto sector took off. And we had a very detailed measure of their qualities for all vehicles produced in China. So the policy, the quick pro quo, was essentially put in place to incentivize technology transfer from foreign firms and to the domestic partners. Well, we have, you know, outlook following the industry for, you know, quite some period of time, we have discovered, indeed, the policy benefited the domestic partners. However, this ownership affiliation only contributed less than 10% of the quality improvement for the domestic partners. So our view of this is while um, this particular quid pro quo 
uh, technology transfer policy is perhaps at work, but uh, the majority, the the um, most of the factors contributing to the domestic auto firms quality improvement is not its policy, but rather the presence of foreign firms, you know, the growing talent of domestic managers and technicians, and, the, and more importantly, the, the growth of domestic parts sector. Then we turned to the electric vehicle sector um, and follow the, you know, expand anal our analysis to globally. So we have data on the global electric vehicle sales as well as electric vehicle battery production. There, the picture is very different. Where we showed that, uh, so we started from 2014, 2013 to 2020, when uh, China's EV production as well as the battery production was about to take off. And so in our analysis, we showed, we look at several policies. One is that all countries subsidized electric vehicles purchases, you know, during this period. And, and then a key feature, very different from the other traditional industries, is there's very significant learning by doing in EV battery production. So we all know that in the cost of EV battery production dropped by 90% from 2010 to 2020. And then so China did, uh, like other countries, subsidies turned out to be global complements. The US subsidies benefit all other regions, similarly as the Chinese subsidies and, and European subsidies. This is because when the firm subsidizes the EV purchase, it will increase demand for electric vehicle battery, which then accelerate the learning by doing at the battery sector, which then lower the EV prices in the future, then further stimulate purchase. Um, so this is really, you know, the key factor at play. With learning by doing, it turned out that the policies, industrial policies, actually are very different. When we look at the welfare analysis, you know, the all subsidies turn out to be welfare positive, and they reinforce each other. They generate more surplus in consumer surplus and producer surplus than the expenses uh, incurred by the government. And in from 2013, sorry, January 2016 to, to June 2019, China also implemented a whitelist policy, which essentially ties the domestic EV subsidies to domestic battery suppliers. In 2015, China became the largest EV market, but Chinese uh, battery suppliers are lagging behind Japan and South Korea. See, but we show crucially by the end of the policy, the whitelist policy, which is very similar in spirit to the US Inflation Reduction Act, the local content requirement, China's Chinese battery suppliers have already caught up with Japan, South Korea, and, um, and essentially now become the leading uh, battery suppliers by 2024. The dominant Chinese battery suppliers accounting for more than 60% of worldwide battery uh, production. And so in this policy here, the whitelist policy, unlike the subsidies, are essentially generated big business dealing away from rivals. And we, we also show, um, we show that China benefited from the whitelist policy by, you know, so this doesn't require the government to do anything. It just essentially a shift away from foreign suppliers to domestic suppliers. It benefits China by $2 billion at the cost of four foreign countries of $4 billion. But even within China, the, e, uh, the battery firms benefited at the expense of EV firms because the input is more expensive initially and the consumers. So 70% of the gains to the EV firm, uh, battery firms actually are offset by the losses to consumers and, um, and EV, uh, supply, EV downstream firms. So you, you can see that there's a spectrum of industrial policies. Some of them are welfare generation generating, some actually are you can create substantial distortions. Um, I know I took more than three minutes, I, I apologize. So why don't I end here and um, leave the time for the further discussion. Thank you. That was really valuable, though, because I think you gave us a broad sense about how, you know, different policies um, can, uh, you know, be impactful on different uh, aspects. And right, you know, if, if you're looking at different types of metrics, you might see different types of um, um, uh, results. Let me turn to Gerard.
Um, and 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 please, Gerard, take only like a couple of minutes to respond so that we get time to go to Chloe and then also have maybe a little bit of a discussion. Uh, but Gerard, I think, you know, you and I spend a lot of time in D.C. thinking about policy, right? We talk to policymakers, we talk to companies, um, and, and we also look at the academic research. But why don't you give me a bit of a sense of how you think all this relates to um you know, DC policymaking and, and, and uh, you know, I think one thing to keep in mind is the incoming administration, right, the, the Trump administration um, is, I think, a little more skeptical towards industrial policy on the whole, but uh, it's going to be inheriting a big uh, industrial policy portfolio from the Biden administration. And I think it's coming in an era of, you know, resilience being a big topic, uh, you know, either de-risking or decoupling, right? A lot of, uh, you know, topics that do relate back to sort of industrial or targeted industrial uh, policy and uncertain aspects. So why don't you give me a bit of a sense of how you're looking at these topics? I think we're even, we're having this discussion, at least in the DC context, because of national security concerns. I think that's what's spurring action on both sides of the Pacific. And it's the primary motivation on the Chinese side and on the US side. The CHIPS Act is I've almost never heard it framed in terms of productivity, even if that actually might be the right way to think about it. I think both sides are uh, worried about the other, to put it mildly, uh, and I would say more quietly or maybe not so quietly preparing for the contingency that they might go to war. And I think that is really the underlying motivation for the self-reliance efforts that were clearly the, the paramount target in the third plenum in China. And I think it's the motivation, at least behind the CHIPS Act, the IRA is a little bit different because there is an environmental aspect to that. But it's interesting because on, on the uh, incoming Trump administration side, the skepticism about industrial policy is not really with, with the CHIPS Act. That people buy into that because of the national security argument. It's with EVs really because of an anti-climate uh, view, although we'll see how Elon Musk and others uh, affect that. Um, I think in general, you could you could imagine priorities or goals as being sort of like a like a, a three-way Venn diagram, right? So on the one hand, you might have productivity, and that definitely is the thing that matters in the long run from an economic perspective. In the middle, maybe overlapping, you would have something like market share or market dominance. And on the other side, you might have resilience or self, self-reliance, self right? Those things are, these two, self-reliance and productivity could very well be the opposite. Or another way of putting it is um, efficiency and resiliency are often the opposites, right? So if you have very tight just-in-time supply chains, they could be very efficient, low cost, but there's not a lot of resiliency there. And this is part of the narrative in DC about why we need to do industrial policy because of what happened during COVID. Although I would argue that Asian factories that held up pretty well uh, and trade saved us, but that's not the dominant narrative. Um, and so I think if, if you're thinking about it from national security lens, it's 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 metrics that are different. Um, I would also say as a somewhat separate matter, um, there's a lot to say about the difficulty of measuring industrial policy and assessing its effectiveness. But I would also caution against um, being too linear in extrapolation. So just take electric vehicles, for example. The discourse, say three or four years ago, was largely about um, companies like NEO or others, or like White Elephant Projects, a lot of provinces having their own um, you know, government guidance funds wasting money and it wasn't going so well. Uh, but then all of a sudden it, it turned quite rapidly. So looking at our BNF data on the terminal. So in, even in 2020, China in domestically was selling about 1.2 million electric vehicles in its own market. By 2023, that was over 8 million. And it, it had been basically flat for five years, and then it went vertical. And so if you're if the analysis is based on what, what the discourse looked like in, say, 2020, um, it's, it's a different world now. There are also sectors like solar panels, where we know from filings that a lot of Chinese solar panel companies are operating at a loss, and subsidies are probably propping them up. That is definitely not efficient. However, China is almost completely dominant in solar panel production, and that seems to be a cost that, that Beijing is willing to bear. And so I think we have to sort of start by asking, what is the objective here? I think economists would certainly agree it should be productivity, but that is definitely not the consensus in DC, nor is it in Beijing. Thank you, Gerard. I think that's, um, you know, helpful um, to keep in mind. And I think, you know, on the climate side, it is worth noting that some of these technologies uh, just simply it's unclear that they would have actually ever emerged if had, there had not been like substantial Chinese government support, state support for for some of them. Um, and and then you know we're at a point where they're you know Chinese companies are highly innovative. Although 
there may be like big distortions and there may be a lot of subsidies still in some cases. Um, and to that point, let me turn to Chloe uh, Papazian, who is, you know, at the OECD and is thinking a lot about trade and subsidies and, uh, um, you know, and, and how those, uh, the interplay of all those. So let, let us move away from Washington and more towards sort of the uh, multilateral side of things. Um, Chloe, let me uh, pass it to you and let us, you know, talk a little bit about what the impact of industrial policy is more broadly on um, the global system. Thank you, Ilaria. So for, to answer your question, um, I would like first briefly to focus on the main lessons we have learned while collecting data on industrial subsidies through um, a financial le firm level financial information across 14 different industrial sectors over a period spanning from 2005 to 2022. In a second time, just as you mentioned, I would like to point out the empirical challenges that these main lessons pose for any work measuring um, the global the trade impacts of such industrial subsidies. Uh, I will be very uh, brief on this second point and happy to discuss further in the discussion if time allows. So uh, as, as, as regards the lessons we have learned while collecting data on industrial subsidies, uh, we have now such information for uh, more than 480 companies uh, listed and long listed in 14 different industrial sector between 2005 and 2022. And this data collection efforts has enabled us to draw some key lessons on industrial subsidies, notably in China, and I would list three of them. So first, both OECD and non-OECD countries use subsidies in the form of grants, income tax concessions, and below market borrowings. Yet what we have seen is that China-based producers have been the largest recipient of subsidies across the various industrial sectors we cover throughout the period. One important point we would like to make is that um, governments, including in China, make use of the three types of instruments we quantify to support industrial firms. This underscores that to the extent possible, all three instruments, grants, income tax concessions, and below market borrowings should be in our view included in empirical studies in order to avoid wrongly attributing outcome caused by subsidies to other factors. And this resonates to what Pamela has been saying on the um, complexity of and the inherent complexity of industrial policies. The second lesson is that state enterprises, notably in China, play a pivotal role in, for instance, providing themselves subsidies to other state or private enterprises, or in favoring other domestic companies, for example, the discriminatory public procurement. The third lesson, and again, this resonates with what uh, Panle has been saying, is that subsidies received by industrial companies often form part of an ecosystem of measures and policies that may exacerbate the effect of subsidies on recipient companies. And by ecosystem of measures and policies, we mean two different things. First, so subsidies, notably in China, may occur at every stage of the value chain. This may imply that a given industrial product may benefit not only from the subsidies received by the producer itself, but also from cheaper input from its suppliers who have received subsidies themselves. Um, this it remains, however, difficult at this stage to measure the extent to which subsidies received by a company at the upstream level of production trickle down to companies located at the downstream level. Beyond what we may call this subsidization chain, Another point about this ecosystem of measures and policies is that often measures uh, accompany produce other measures accompany producer subsidies, such as trade barriers, including import restriction or export restriction, market access restriction, including an obligation to form a joint venture with a local producers, consumer subsidies with local content requirements, or weaker regula regulatory rules. <clears throat> 
So these various lessons we have learned shed light on the empirical challenges attached to measure whether industrial uh, subsidies uh, are a success or a failure, and what is the trade, the global impact of such industrial subsidies. Uh, perhaps two very quick points here is the fact that um, to understand the impact of such industrial subsidies in a given country, in a sector or across sectors, you need to identify first and quantify first this ecosystem of measures. And this might be difficult due to, at times, the persistent lack of transparency surrounding some subsidies measures, including measures we do not cover yet at the OECD, such as the provision of below market energy or the provision of below market land. And um, second, this ecosystem of measures to which I referred earlier pose important challenges for identifying the impact of any given measure in isolation of from all others, in, in, including when support builds along the value chain. So I think I will stop here to allow a bit of discussion and happy to discuss further. Thank you so much. I think that's, uh, you know, that provides sort of an interesting, uh, you know, broader perspective on, on, on what the impact is. But I, let me let me try and sort of uh, draw a few threads that have come up from the conversation here. Right. We have, um, you know, evidence that perhaps industrial policy um, has, you know, in the long term, um, you know, doesn't bring those gains in productivity that are necessary um, and, and could lead to, you know, to a lot of wasteful and ineffective results, right? Then we also have, you know, sense that maybe there are some, you know, maybe it doesn't, it's not effective on productivity, but it can have other maybe more positive effects, right, on welfare. Um, and that, you know, if if you design policy in a certain way, if you are more flexible, you can have some better results, especially maybe at the sectoral level, maybe your outcome, maybe if you, especially if you're trying to achieve sort of um, specific outcomes at the sectoral level, right, like acquiring market share um, and or innovation on, on certain types of technologies. And then I think then that ties into maybe what Gerard was saying, where me, governments aren't necessarily thinking about productivity, and maybe they should, right? Maybe Maybe this is this is a problem, but they're not necessarily thinking about that. They're thinking about resiliency. They're thinking about redundancy, right? Which is absolutely the opposite of efficiency. Uh, but they're doing so for national security reasons, which uh, sometimes are hard to um, to to argue with, right? Uh, because it is national security. And then you know that then brings us to the question of well, what does it hap What happens to our whole? You know, what happens to the rest of the world when um, large economies and you know China obviously being such a massive economy is engaging in in, in widespread uh, industrial policy. Um, so do you, I would ask the panels, and this is a sort of an impossible question, but how do you resolve these different tensions and these different um, uh, the, these different priorities at the government level, right? I think, you know, let's think of the incoming um, U.S. administration, but also, you know, there's other administrations around the world there. You know, Germany is going to have elections soon. Um, European Union just uh, had its own new um, commission. Um, how how should we, how should they be thinking about it? Lee, I see you raised your hand, please. Yeah. So, so I think another thing that's come out of this um, and is exemplified in the great research by Panla is that we really need to fully account for the cost. Um, and I think one of the ways that, you know, Panla has really moved our understanding forward um, is that, you know, she, she and her co-author sort of realize that it's very hard to directly measure all these subsidies. And so instead they constructed this, you know, very sophisticated model of the shipbuilding industry, and they inferred the subsidies based on the observed behavior of shipyards in, in the model. And it, you know, led to these conclusions, right, that, you know, once you total up the enormous cost expended promoting this sector, they actually outweigh the benefits. Right now, it's very hard to do this kind of analysis, right? You kind of have to do this industry by industry and sector by sector. You kind of have to build a bespoke model in every context. But I think it's really important to account for the costs. And I would argue, and I hope Panla would agree, that in some ways we might need to even go beyond what Panla and her co-authors have done. For instance, if Chinese industrial policy leads Western countries to retaliate against China, then that needs to be factored into the cost, right? And I don't want to make China solely responsible for the breakdown of the global trading system. There's plenty of you know, blame to go around, but it certainly bears part of the blame. 
right? And I can't think of any country that has more to lose from a breakdown in the global trading system than the world's largest exporter of manufactured goods, right? And we're in a world where, you know, FDI inflows into China have collapsed from an all-time high of, you know, 340 some odd billion dollars in 2021 to negative 5 billion in the first quarter of 2024. Foreign venture capital investment in Chinese startups has collapsed. Foreign investors are pulling their money out. Right. I mean, these are huge costs to China. To what extent could we attribute them to Chinese industrial policy? Certainly not the only factor, but it is a factor. And I think once we factor in those costs, right, then it becomes even harder to come to the conclusion that these policies have generated a net benefit. Yeah. So account for the costs. Thank you. And I think that's worth noting. I mean, there's there's excellent research uh, by uh, Meg Rivmeyer, uh, Kelly Tsai and, and uh, Margaret Pearson looking at how, um, you know, in economic policy and economic security policy in China, national security uh, objectives in China have actually made China in some ways less secure because it has triggered sort of global responses um, to to it uh, on the commercial side of things. So I think that speaks to some of the, the points you've been making. But let me put it to this, right? And, and uh, you know, I don't know if who, if Panla or Gerard or maybe and Chloe wants to respond to this. It's true that maybe shipbuilding, um, it has, you know, the cost uh, outweighs the benefits. And yet, um, you know, this does put China in sort of a, a special position in uh, on a national security front, right? And in Washington, it's certainly raised a lot of concerns, right? That uh, that China has this this dominance over shipbuilding. So I think that does, you know, I'm sure there are people in 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 Beijing who think the cost was well worth it uh, because it's given China such a lead in what is a pretty strategic industry, right? Um, I don't know if anybody has thoughts on that or or how to. Yes, Gerard, please. I think shipbuilding is a good example because it's capital intensive and it's, it's slow to change. And it, it, in, in where it succeeded in Japan and Korea and in China, there were industrial policies in all cases. In the U.S., you're right, at least in D.C., there is a lot of concern about China's dominance in shipmaking. And that's both commercial shipmaking, which is the vast majority of volume, but also on the defense side. Um, it, it, in the U.S., I think that the discourse is um, digging into this a bit more that the U.S. lost what was sort of left of its residual shipbuilding capacity when the Reagan administration got rid of its cost differential subsidy, which is to say it ended a rather inefficient and expensive uh, industrial policy. Nonetheless, we still have things like the Jones Act, which I think is economically stupid, but you know it, it exists for, for a reason, whether you like it or not. And at the end of the day, we're still getting back to, to the point where we are today, which is the U.S. has basically no commercial shipbuilding capacity, and even our naval shipbuilding capacity is, is far or less than even our own current demands, including to meet uh, requests by, by, say, Australia for subs and, and other things. The solution to that is almost certainly industrial policy, or you could say it doesn't matter, right? I think a, a broader point is that when we talk about objectives, we have to say, what are the objectives and why should they be the objectives, right? So if, if you think that productivity should be the only thing that matters, you can certainly make that argument economically. But if you also think there are legitimate national security concerns on both sides, I think that substantially muddies the discourse. Um, and I think if it, we have to basically either say the national security concerns are not that big of a deal or they're overblown, in which case you could say, okay, let's focus on this other thing, or you say actually they are a big deal, in which case we've moved the conversation in a different direction. Um, I see, Lee, uh, you, you, but yeah, I wanted to give the chance to uh, Panla and Chloe to also sort of comment um, and maybe, you know, and, and, and maybe if Chloe can also, I mean, Panla and Chloe can also sort of think about um, how to move forward on, on some of these issues, right? What what are actually sort of some sol potential solutions uh, that policymakers could take into consideration? Panla, you can go first. Okay, um, so I um, so um, sh uh, you know my colleagues and I have looked at um, the shipbuilding industry going back 150 years worldwide, and I think for every cases we examined, every case we examined, particularly the successful case cases, um, they're all supported by government, you know, some kind of government policy. There are also failed attempts. So it doesn't mean that every I mean, US tried and failed, Brazil tried and failed, and South Korea tried in the 60s and failed, and then succeeded in the 70s. And But I think it is quite clear that um, 
uh, other considerations in addition to economic arguments are important for the government policies. And in our analysis, we show that um, there's a couple of dimensions we can't really measure and model if, you know, in the empirical analysis. One is the benefit from trade. Indeed, you know, Chinese uh, subsidies generated a trade volume that's 10 times larger than the subsidies. And so the, you know, how do you quantify the welfare benefits from that? We also show we don't really, we can't argue causality, uh, causality, but we do show that military production of ships also increased by several folds you know, during this period when China implemented industrial policy. Um, so indeed, I agree that industrial policies are often, not often, are not just motivated by economic considerations. That's the first thing I want to mention. The second, I also want to argue, I actually personally, I don't, I'm not a, a you know, pro proponent of industrial policy. I'm not also not a, you know, saying we can't do it. I think there's a way to do it. And it's not, you know, that's what I said in the beginning. It's so complex that even the same policy, if you do it differently, if you implement it differently, either the timing, either the targeting, the punishment, you know, reward and punishment can make a big difference. That's what our analysis have shown. And third, I think in the case, there are cases, economic arguments that actually justify or motivate industrial policies, in particular when we have market failures or distortions and learning by doing is a good example. In, I have looked at several historical cases, you know, U.S. steel industry in the 1900, 1900, early 1900s, and, and you know, literature, the ones that in the literature, when there are uh, infant industries, you know, now we're looking at semiconductor industry, there are economic arguments or electric vehicle battery production that uh, there are significant spillover generated by the commercial activities that perhaps justify industrial policies. But I want to you know, have a cautionary tale, which is um, how you do it can make a big difference. And even if the, the government, the policy is motivated by good economic argument, but if it doesn't implement well, it can still lead to you know, disastrous uh, outcomes. And finally, um, in terms of the implication of other countries, it's definitely very important consideration. And as we show, you know, in the EV global EV sector, what China and also the you know the global shipbuilding sector, what China has done has caused damage. You know, has led to st business stealing away from rival countries, and that needs to be you know taken into consideration when we talk about policies. Thank you, and and with that, that I think uh, is a perfect segue to Chloe. Any final thoughts? Yes. Um, so unfortunately, I won't offer an oven ready solution on what uh, we should uh, do to respond to industrial policies or whether we should ourselves uh, respond through industrial policies. But um, my, my general thinking would be that uh, we should uh, first um, have a really good understanding of what is uh, the benefits and the costs of industrial um, subs pol subsidies and industrial policies, and thus to have a very good, careful quantification exercise of such measures and a good sense of their design and the broader context in which they are in which they are provided. Bearing in mind that if you uh, draw a lesson from what happened uh, in Japan uh, in some years ago or in China today may not be easily replicated in another country due to a very different context, a very different country, a very different uh, government. So yeah. 欢迎来到六度解析新闻背后的多维思考，带你洞悉头条背后的世界。在今日华尔街频道的六度解析中，我们将深入探究时事热点，为你揭开新闻背后的真相。在这个信息泛滥、真相难觅的时代，六度解析
更是一种赋能的工具。加入今日华尔街的六度解析，共同探索头条背后的故事。你通往深度理解的旅程，从这里开始。不要只是阅读新闻，要解码新闻，理解新闻，活出新闻。这一切尽在六度解析。立即订阅，不错过任何真知灼见。因为了解真相，仅仅是个开始。